Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening. Welcome to South Asia News Line. I'm Lepak Shikurana. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you. Prison chief murdered in India's Jammu and Kashmir. Police denies terror angle. Pakistanis face new struggles to rebuild life in aftermath of floods. And Nepal coalition to aim for growth if returned to power says Finance Minister. And now for all the details, the Director General of Prison Service in India's Jammu and Kashmir, Hemant Kumar Lohia, was found murdered at his home in the Jammu region, the police said on Tuesday. The main suspect, a household helper, has been arrested. A senior police official said, denying any terror angle amid reports of an Islamist terror group claiming the killing. The Director General of Prisons in India's Jammu and Kashmir, Heman Kumar Lohia, was found murdered at his home on Monday night in the Jammu region, police said on Tuesday. A senior police official said 57-year-old Lohia's throat had been cut and his body bore burns. The main suspect, a household helper, had been arrested after a manhunt, the police said, amid reports of terror group People's Anti-Fascist Front, PAFF, claiming the killing. The PAFF in a statement on social media said the killing was a small gift to Interior Minister Amit Shah, who is on a three-day visit to Kashmir. The initial investigation suggested it was not a terror act, but police were investigating, Mukesh Singh, a top police official, said. The evidence Police have blamed groups like the PAFF for targeted killings, but terrorists have not killed any security official of Lohia's seniority in recent years. In news from Pakistan, a 65-year-old farmer from Pakistan's Sindh province returned to his home after living in a camp for a month and found out most of his home was destroyed due to the devastating floods that have killed nearly 1,700 across the country. He said he was, however, happy he and his family were finally back. But they feel overwhelmed by the rebuilding process ahead. After a month living in a makeshift relief camp, 65-year-old farmer Jan Mohammad Lashari and his family returned to their village in Sindh province and found that most of their home was destroyed due to catastrophic floods in Pakistan. He was among the hundreds of people who were forced to flee from their homes. The father of eight said he was happy that they were back to their place but feels overwhelmed by the rebuilding process ahead as the roofs are in a fragile condition and a big part of the house has already been destroyed. Lashari said his family had managed to escape the rapidly rising flood waters, finding refuge in the camp about three kilometers away from his village. <laughs> Meanwhile, the United Nations has revised up its humanitarian appeal for Pakistan fivefold to 816 million US dollars from 160 million dollars as it seeks to control a surge in waterborne diseases following the country's worst floods in decades. Nearly 1,700 people have been killed in the floods caused by heavy monsoon rains and melting glaciers in a crisis that the Pakistan government and the UN have blamed on climate change. 
And more news from Pakistan. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif has accused his predecessor Imran Khan of creating unrest in the nation and chaos in the state institutions over his leaked audio controversy. Imran Khan has repeatedly alleged that the trust vote which ousted him as the Prime Minister was a foreign conspiracy against him by the United States, a charge Washington denies. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif on Monday vowed to hold his predecessor and opposition PTI party chief Imran Khan accountable before the law for putting national security at stake by manipulating diplomatic cipher. Local media reported in a hard-hitting statement issued by the PM office, Shahbaz accused Khan of running a smear campaign against the state institutions. He said the recent purported audio leaks have exposed Imran's plot to play on the cipher for political gains against the interest of Pakistan. He added Khan has been targeting state institutions in a bid to escape punishment in several cases. Imran Khan has repeatedly alleged that the trust vote which ousted him as the Prime Minister was a foreign conspiracy against him by the United States. He also claimed to have a diplomatic cable to prove it despite public denials by Washington. Meanwhile, the Islamabad High Court on Monday accepted an apology tendered by Imran Khan and dropped a contempt of court case against him, his defense lawyer said, a ruling that eases the threat to him of disqualification from politics. The court had deferred Khan's indictment over the contempt case after he apologized to the court in person late last month. The charges were related to a speech by Khan in which he was accused of threatening police and judicial officers after one of his close aides was denied bail in a sedition case. Ahmed Khan sahab jo unke counsel the unhone kaha ji ji bilkul contemptory court mein maujood hain aur inhone hi file kiya hai aur is chuke last date ke upar humne submission ki thi and unconditional apology ki thi which was uh, honorable court consider that apology so today uh, is was a uh, just uh, appear in court is show that uh, i was uh, filed this affidavit and uh, contempt is uh, procedure also, also closed today the cricket star turned politician has faced a spate of legal woes since his ouster in a confidence vote in April. He has been leading rallies since his dismissal demanding snap elections which the ruling coalition has rejected, saying voting will be held as scheduled later next year. While well, moving on, a Kashmiri activist recently highlighted the cross-border terrorism in India's Jammu and Kashmir region at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. He said during the past 15 years, thousands of civilians and security personnel have lost their lives due to attacks by terrorists aided by Pakistan. Shuib Lone, a Kashmiri activist, recently highlighted the issue of cross-border terrorism in Kashmir at the United Nations Human Rights Council event in Geneva, blaming that Pakistan facilitates the movement of its proxies across the border with motive of creating terror in the minds of people in the region. He said during the past 15 years, thousands of civilians have lost their lives in terrorism, apart from thousands of defence, paramilitary and police personnel who have sacrificed their lives in the line of duty. While describing the impact on women, he said there are also numerous incidents of involuntary labor and sexual violence by terrorists. Infiltration and smuggling of narcotics, arms and weapons across the borders have been matters of constant and relentless anxiety to all concerned agencies manning the borders, he said. To date, the families of victims of cross-border terrorism continue to live under fear and threat. I have a strong faith in the international community, role to address these challenges and an increase in coverage of these incidents with a specific focus on women and reporting about perpetrators who gradually created an environment that would keep such activities in check. India has long blamed that Pakistan aids and infiltrates terrorists across the border to spread unrest in its Jammu and Kashmir region and uses them as proxy to mount attacks on Indian soil. Pakistan, however, denies the charges. In news from Nepal, Nepal's Finance Minister Janardhan Sharma has said the ruling coalition will provide incentives for exporters and lift import curbs if it returns to power in the general election next month. Nepal is recovering steadily after two years of the coronavirus pandemic and surging energy prices this year. 
Nepal's ruling coalition will provide incentives for exporters and lift import curbs as part of efforts to put the economy on a higher growth trajectory if it is returned to power in a general election next month, Finance Minister Janardhan Sharma has said. Led by the centrist Nepali Congress Party and a group of former Maoist rebels, the five-party alliance which has been in government since July last year hopes to win voters' confidence in the November 20 vote for the 275-member parliament. Nepal, one of the poorest countries in Asia, wedged between China and India, is recovering steadily after two years of the coronavirus pandemic and surging energy prices this year. In an interview with Reuters, Finance Minister Sharma said, Nepal's recent economic woes and political stability would be a priority for voters in the election for the national parliament and seven state assemblies. He said the government will focus on export promotion, for which there are immense possibilities, like in hydropower, steel and cement, to narrow the trade deficit rather than limiting imports. He said a ban on the import of cars, liquor and mobile telephones could soon be lifted as foreign exchange reserves have increased to $9.42 billion now, sufficient to cover imports for eight months. But critics and opposition parties say the economy is still facing huge problems. The Asian Development Bank said in a report last month, Nepal's economic growth was likely to ease to 4.7% year-on-year this fiscal year, reflecting the tightening of monetary policy and higher inflationary pressures. And an Indian startup has developed the country's first human carrying drone, specifically designed for warships for carrying cargo and humans. The device can pick up to 100 kilograms of cargo and can fly for 25 to 30 minutes up to a height of 500 meters from the takeoff position. An Indian startup has developed the country's first human carrying drone, specifically designed for warships for carrying cargo and humans. The drone, which uses 16 rotors, has been designed by Pune-based SDE, the Sagar Defence Engineering Company, in close collaboration with the Indian Navy. SDE founder CEO Nikunj Parashar said it can pick up to 100 kgs of cargo and can fly for 25 to 30 minutes to a range of about 20 kilometers up to a height of 500 meters from the takeoff position. The drone also has a ballistic parachute in case of safety failure and can sustain 30 to 40 percent battery failure. The startup company is looking to expand into commercial usage in the coming three to four years by launching an urban air mobility vehicle for humans, which will be especially useful in case of carrying out medical emergency operations. And devotees across India on Tuesday offered prayers in temples of Hindu goddess Durga on the auspicious occasion of Navmi, the last day of Navratri festival. Serpentine queues were also witnessed outside the famous Taleju Bhavani temple in neighboring Nepal as its gates were reopened for devotees after one year on the occasion. Hindu devotees in parts of India offered prayers at temples and marquees on the auspicious occasion of Navmi, the last day of the nine-day festival of Navratri on Tuesday. Goddess Siddhidatri, the ninth form of Durga, is worshipped on the ninth day of the festival. Navratri holds immense importance in Hinduism. Hindus fast and offer prayers to please the goddess during the festival, while some spurn meat, onions and garlic in their diets. Devotees in capital New Delhi queued at temples early in the day to get a glimpse of the idol of the goddess, which they had been deprived of during the coronavirus period. Corona kal me bahut mushkil ho gaya tha darshan ke liye, magar ab jab se thoda sa acha hua hai to bahut acha lag raha hai. Aur mai har naraate pure aati hu, aur bahut achi hai vastha bhi bahut achi hai is baar to. Matlab maa ne bahut khule darshan diye, maa sabko aise khule darshan deti rahe. Similar scenes were witnessed in northeastern Guwahati city as devotees thronged temples and were seen praying and offering flowers to the idol of the goddess. Navratri celebrates the victory of Durga over the evil buffalo demon king Mahishasur. The goddess represents power and the feminine force. It is believed that the goddess Durga descends on earth during this period to rid it of demons and blesses her devotees with happiness and prosperity. The festival culminates with the Shara festival on the 10th day. 
Meanwhile, in neighboring Nepal, thousands of devotees stood in queues since we hours outside the famous Taleju Bhavani Temple as its doors were reopened just for a day after one year on the occasion. The queue stretched to all the possible corner and turnings near the Basantpur Darbar Square while goats and buffaloes were sacrificed to please the goddess. The temple is opened only on Mahanavmi, the ninth day of the ongoing Dashain festival. The day of Mahanavmi is also considered as final day to make sacrifices to Goddess Durga and her various incarnations during the Shen. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.